Now, for the future, so long as the United States remains recommitted to Europe, the transatlantic alliance will prosper. American commitment, military commitment has already increased. More resources have arrived. But the trick for Europe in strategic terms is whether or not a new Republican administration, possibly one that will be led, if not by Donald Trump, but a Trumpist at heart, someone who is more inclined towards isolationism or more inclined towards basically forgetting about Europe and committing mainly to Asia, if such a person comes to power, will they actually continue to be committed to Europe, its security, as the current administration, perhaps the last true Atlanticist in power, Joe Biden's administration did. Opinions are divided on this. Many pundits believe that this commitment is there to stay, that this war also made the United States understand the folly of the Trumpian approach to Europe, which was dismissive of the European Union, which was dismissive of NATO, which did not see any need for NATO, and that therefore, to the extent that they believe the United States does need Europe, the commitment will continue. There are others who are not so sure, and they're not so sure mainly because of possible domestic developments in the United States. So this is our context, and in the next two to three years, we will know for sure what the transatlantic relations will be. It is important to note, in, in my judgment, that the uh, West today, in, in terms of security, is not just the transatlantic alliance, but it is an alliance of the two shores of the Atlantic with those partners of the United States who have already joined forces in Quad, what I would call the systemic West. And to the extent that the relations between NATO and New Zealand, Australia, Korea, Japan, India can be tightened with the aim of containing China, then the relations, I think, between the United States and Europe will also remain as they are pretty close for the relevant future. In economic terms, many agree that the um, war not just opened the eyes of the Europeans to the folly of the previous political economy model, but it also opened their eyes to the perils of treating China as a basically non-threatening power. Therefore, the uh, approach to China, Chinese investments in European countries, the penetration of Chinese technology, the presence of China uh, as a procurer of European technology, all those are also being questioned. So Europe will need not just a new security approach, but a new political economy approach. And that also will necessitate, in my view, a transformation that will not be solely limited to the green transformation about which Europe has already done quite a lot and leads the pack. Of course, the war, the dependence on energy, the impossibility of substituting the current energy sources with alternative energy sources immediately led to a regression. Coal plants are opened, but Europe is still far ahead in terms of intention, in terms of commitment, on the green transformation than others. So that's one transformation. The second transformation will have to be a greater investment in technology. For the kind of big economy that Europe, European Union economies constitute, or Europe is in general, Europe lags in technological prowess. That in a world where the main fight between the United States and China is going to be fought over technological primacy is unaffordable for the European Union, in my judgment. 
And therefore, that is the critical economic strategic component of a revitalization of Europe, so long as it wants to have remained relevant in the world economy and, of course, in, in the world strategically. That Europe may also have a lot more attraction for the rest of the world, and it will have to actually change the way it handles one of the most important challenges of our world today, partially as a function of the climate crisis, and that challenge is, of course, migration. Climate crisis is in the background of civil wars, like in Syria or in many uh, African countries, in the Sahel in particular. And those people who have no longer any arable land to till or water to drink will seek better conditions and better climates and will move on. Therefore, Europe can no longer treat that problem as something that can be dealt with with ad hoc measures. Whether or not European political systems under the constraints of their own domestic dynamics, under the pressure of right-wing populist parties, can actually find a way of legitimizing a set of policies to their publics which would make migration a manageable thing rather than a threat and explain how a mediated and managed migration can actually help Europe for the future. Unless that is diligently done or successfully uh, realized, then the European political systems are going to be under tremendous pressure and therefore the uh, social upheavals, instability, unpredictability and the weaknesses of governments will actually continue. Europe or the European Union has constituted itself as a great model for the rest of the world. People aspire to be there, yes of course for economic reasons but not just for economic reasons. And it is the great challenge of the European Union in the post-Russian invasion of Ukraine to actually rise up to the occasion and to refurbish or re recalibrate itself and actually become a force to reckon with in the 21st century. In that, European companies as well have a very important role to play and I think the starting point for both companies and for governments would be to look at the world from a different lens and see things as they are rather than as they used to be.